Ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and we are here looking at a tumbling flower beetle. And I've been chatting with Hashi in the um, chat box, and she says, let's do it. Um, now, I love these beetles for their really odd shape. So you can see from the top, he looks really narrow. And you've got up here, let's see. You've got the head, this would be the pronotum, or that first segment of the thorax, and then these orange and black guys to about here, these are the elytra, or the first pair of wings. Now, um, this beetle does have the ability to fly, he does have um, membranous wings underneath those, but those are not, they're not full length. You can see the rest of his abdomen underneath. And he's this kind of perfect tumbling shape. So he'll sit on the edge of flowers, and then they tumble off. Oh, Susan was going to request a beetle. Good. Um, but if we turn this beetle sideways, You see, he's really, really tall. <laughs> so he's really, really narrow, but he has he's he has a pretty good like height. So if I get it all the way zoomed out right about here, this is about where I can get a measurement, and I can measure from the front of his head to the back of his abdomen pretty easily. Let's see. Oh, and I had it in inches for my students. Switch it over centimeters for you guys. Uh, our, the tumbling flower beetle is 1.13 centimeters long. Um, so it is, I mean, it's a good sized beetle, but it's not huge. You can see the size of the pin in relation to the beetle. Um, you can also see from this angle, we can see the edges of the elytra pretty well. And you'll notice that the, the first pair of wings, those elytra, they, they actually kind of end in a point right here. Let's see if we can grab it in focus. There we go. So right about here, you can see the end of the elytra. It's just in this point here, right there. Cool deal. Alrighty. Oh no. I might have messed up my, uh, well, we're going to have to change it just a little bit. That's better. Okay. All right, very good. So, tumbling flower beetles are in their own their are their own family of beetle. The family name is Ripiforidae. Um, I'm not sure what that family name is derived from. Um, and I know that it used to be spelled with an H. I, when I was learning this family, I spelled it Ripiforidae, R-H-I. Um, but nowadays, they got rid of that H. And so they must have discovered that we had been misspelling it for a while and decided to send it back to the right one. It looks like some kind of anime villain. Oh, man. If you think that it looks like a villain right now, um, I... I'm excited for you to see it head on. Let's see if we can get it just right. Because the specimen is... Hmm... All right, so I can get it head on, but here's the deal. I know that I already have a good microscope image of this beetle head on, so let me just go ahead and add it to the live stream really quick. Let's see. 
Um, because I've been taking decent um, microscope images, and it's been a whole lot of fun stacking them. And so I know that. Yeah. There we go. That is what this beetle looks like head on. And I think that it looks like a, like a, like a scary Halloween mask even. I think that, um, you would be really cool to have those type of antenna and that kind of bulge on the top of your head for Halloween. Totally would be great. Um, oh, hi, Eric. Oh, no. We're looking at the wedge-shaped the wedge-shaped beetle. Sorry. I had the family name right, though. Rip of 40 was correct. Tumbling flower beetles are a little different. Thank you. So the common name is not tumbling flower beetles. It's the wedge-shaped beetle. Derp. Um, and the family is Ripiforidae. I mixed up my family, my com, I mixed up the common names, guys. How dare I? All right. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I think that this one's pretty cool because I was able to stack a whole bunch of images. And so I wanted to make sure we got to see this guy, um, before we got to sketching a little bit. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. You're right. The scape and the pedestal, they're nice and bright orange. And then the rest of it, the flagellum, you might even have the first segment of the flagellum being um, darkened. But that's a, that's a, a great observation. Wedge-shaped beetle, wedge-shaped beetle, wedge-shaped Alrighty. So I'm thinking that this one would be a fun will be a fun one to um, go ahead and sketch laterally because you have so much of this um, of this height here on the beetle. Whereas if we tried to sketch it from the top, it would be so so narrow. <laughs> oh, thanks, Eric. So. Um, we're gonna go wedge shaped beetle in the family Ripiforidae. Very good. And I actually might turn my paper landscape so that my beetle, um, I can fit my beetle in a larger space. Um, so up here in the front, we always, when we're sketching, we go ahead and we make sure that we're giving a really light outline in the base. And then I come back over and I, um, darken some of the things. Uh, so as we're sketching the full body, luckily we can see the entire specimen over the microscope. And, um, funny enough, it's very, it's all on a very similar plane. So we shouldn't have to focus the microscope up and down too much. Um, you'll notice that the head... Looks kind of small in comparison to the rest of the body. And is pointing more... And is pointing kind of down. So I'm going to go ahead and give myself the overall shape of this head. Which I'm going to start kind of like a slanted oval. I did go ahead and kind of give myself where I imagined the connection of the pronotum here. And then the crest of the head. Um, so as I was sketching, I gave myself those features. I do know that all of this stuff down here is going to be erased and turned into, um, and turned into all of those mouth parts, and we'll be adding the antenna and all of those types. Um, our pronotum, this first segment of the thorax, is super duper high. It's nice and tall. So I'm just going to go ahead and give it a nice tall wedge-shaped body. Let's see. I think I have enough room. We're good. All right, and then up all the way up here on the top, instead of just coming down straight, um, you can see that there's a little bit of a curve along the front of the elytra or the first wing. So we're just gonna make the pronotum up here kind of pointed. 
we're going to give ourselves a little bit of space like this, and then we're going to finish the pronotum by something like something like that. And this is all very light as we're going through, kind of just tagging where we believe these places are going to be, and then we're going to zoom in and check out some of the features closer up. So that's our pronotum. It's also going to be where our first pair of legs are connected. Um, admittedly, the legs, um, the legs are not set in a very natural pose on this specimen. Um, normally the front pair of legs would be going forward, and we might have to turn the specimen to see a lot of the details in the legs. Uh, but what I'm going to do is give ourselves kind of some stick legs, so I know that the hip bone or that coxy is right here, and then... I'm just going to give myself a basic leg shape moving forward just so I know what I'm working with. All right. And then, so I'm looking, when I'm looking at the lateral point of view of our beetle here, I'm trying to look at what we call sclerites. And these are the uh, kind of the pieces of the exoskeleton. And you can see that there are lines in between them. Those are kind of the division of the plates. Um, so I guess you could call the sclerites like exoskeleton plates. And so you've got this first one, the pronotum. You've got the mesonotum, which is the second segment of the thorax. And the third segment looks like it's almost divided in two. Um, you, if you wanted to, you could kind of take it down in this way, and then your top piece is going to be broken into a triangle, whereas the bottom piece is going to be more rectangular. And we'll probably be modifying that shape a little bit as we go through. But that is going to be kind of our overall shape. Now, um, we need a leg on the mesonotum, or the second segment of the thorax, and the third segment of the thorax. And both of them are going to be going backwards, kind of like kind of like this. And then the hind leg, um, just from just from looking at it, you can see that it's extended way past the microscope. And looking at it, it's a pretty long leg. So um, you're going to be connecting it right here to the very end of the last segment of the thorax and likely going to angle it a little further out because it's going to be a, a, a longer leg. <clears throat> All right, so that's the thorax. I'm going to come in and add our shape for our elytra, which is mostly a point here. Okay? And then the abdomen. And I'm just going to give the overall shape of the abdomen rather than counting abdominal segments just yet. So... We're connecting it directly down to the thorax. And... Coming up in that direction. So that gives us the overall body shape of our wedge-shaped beetle. Um, and I didn't type in the chat box what the length of my beetle was or write it down. So if someone wants to let me know if you wrote it down, I'll put it on my paper. <laughs> All right, very good. Convenient how very good, very good. Yes, okay. All right, hope everybody is with me. We are going to be zooming in up on the head of our beetle. Hashi, thank you. 1.13 centimeters. I um I hurt my 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 finger a couple of days ago and it's the finger I used to focus the microscope um or like my pointer finger for focusing the microscope so uh but we got this guys He's so cute. Look at his head. 
I want to see it from a door, from a lateral point of view because this is how we are sketching it. But it's being, it is a little bit difficult to get it to. Ooh. Ah, this would be good. We got this. Aww. He looks good from all angles. Fair enough. He's like a model. No. <laughs> Actually, I don't know how to tell the difference between male and female wedge-shaped beetles. That has never been something that I've learned. Oh, I love, I absolutely love their antenna, though. And my guess would be that it has something to do with the antenna, but um, I would, that would be something I have to learn. So, we are looking at the head shape of our, of our wedge shape, of our beetle here, and um, I have it connected a lot wider than what it is actually connected. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this section here, and I'm going to make this connection from the thorax to the head just a little bit more narrow. All right. And looking at the head here, after it's connected to the thorax, it's going to come up. to a pointed, almost pointed head, and then the flat of its, the, the front of its head is actually pretty flat, all the way down until where you get into the, um, where you get into the, the chewing mouth parts area, region. So, up here, you can pretty much flatten that entire shape out, and then I'm gonna come back up to where it's connected here and give it almost like a little cheek, like round it out a little bit, just away from the body to give it that separation between the head and the thorax. And then this is where your mouth parts are all gonna be sketched in. Um, very good. So, you can see that it has one of its palps down there. Um, I wouldn't be confident in saying whether they are maxillary or labial palps there, but let me go ahead and get that for you. Where did my words go? There they are. So, um, I know that this is not the technical term. Pelps are the technical term. You have maxillary pelps that are um, that are connected right underneath the mandibles, and then you have labial pelps that are connected to the labium, which is the bottom jaw. But all pelps, I like to call them mouth fingers. And I know that that is not a term that you will hear from anybody else. But I imagine insects eating like this and having these little pelps, the top two and the bottom two, and they're going to be pushing all of that food and helping to, like, eat it and push it towards their mandibles. And so these are what pelps are. Um, but you won't hear the phrase mouth fingers from anyone but me. <laughs> and you guys, now that you know it, go ahead and share the, share the love. Um... So when we get down here to the bottom of our uh, of our ripiforids head, we're going to want to add our mandibles. So a lot of times I will kind of end the head pretty abruptly. That's going to be where the mandibles start. And then I'm going to add these. That kind of little curved triangle here. And that is the mandible that is right about here. All right, and then underneath it, you've got this pelp. So let's go ahead and zoom in on the pelp and see um, how many segments it is and what it looks like. We can, we can zoom in further. Zoom in too far and you lose your light. All right, so it almost appears like the first segment is longer, and then you have one, two, one, two, three, four, five segments.
segmented palps. So there's this really long stem segment, and then you have these shorter ones, and there are one, two, three, four, five, Two, three, four shorter ones. Yep, so you have five segmented palps there. Those are actually pretty long. Normally you see kind of three or four segmented palps. And the first one is really long. And then you've got these little ones. One, two, three, four. So you've got these little palps. And he does have um, two on each side. So um, they're... One of, one of this and then the other labial pulp, I don't, I think it's going to be smaller. We can't see them from this angle. Are those some mandibles in front? This is a female. Males often have comb-like antenna. Cool. Thank you, Eric. I learned something today. So you asked if those were mandibles in the front. And... I found the labial palps. They're itty bitty. All right, so you have to kind of almost imagine that they're there, but I promise you, um, if you look right around here, there's this little segment coming out this way and then one more segment out this way. The labial palps are going to be the palps that are actually connected to the bottom jaw of the insect's mouth part, and they are two segmented. So, um, we can now give them names. Those longer ones are maxillary palps. And then the short ones on the bottom, those ones are labial palps. Oh, thank you! There we go. We get some light back. I don't like fighting with the darkness. All right. I need to add a comp. I need to add the eye to this guy. I got so distracted by the mouth parts and the head shape that I haven't gotten the eye taken care of yet. So that's good. We've got some light in here. Um, our uh, The compound eye is going to be approximately... Right about there. I like to make sure I do it nice and light before I before I commit. But I think that that's going to be about right. You want to give yourself a little bit of space on the back side of your head. You also um, are going to find that you want the back side of the eye to be kind of parallel with the back side of the head. So there's this equidistance happening. It'll make your insect look a lot more symmetrical and it'll make it look um, a lot more even. Also, I like to be able to use lines that I've already sketched to base everything else off of. So then I'm going to go ahead and cross hatch inside of the compound eye. And let's put in some antenna on this friend here. So um, the antenna almost look like they're coming off of a little ledge. So instead of having a straight line coming up right here, I am just going to give myself like the smallest of ledges. I'm going to create a ledge here and then I'm going to reconnect the top line so that there's at least a little bit of a separation here. And that is where I'm going to start my antenna. So I'm going to move them forward so they're not interacting with my eye here. I'm going to push them up more like, more like this. All right, so somebody had mentioned earlier they were happy that the um, 
<laughs> that the beetle had uh, color coded our uh, antenna tunnel um, pieces for us. And so, just so that everyone has the spelling of all these body parts I'm about to share with you, the scape, the pedestal, and the flagellum are all segments on the antenna. Now, the scape is that first segment that is nice and long and orange and is the connection of the antenna to the head. The second segment down there that's that really little itty bitty triangle here, that is the pedestal. It's also orange on our beetle, on our beetle friend here. All right, and then it almost looks like the third segment or the first segment of the flagellum um, is half orange and half dark, and then the rest of the antenna are pretty dark. Now, Eric had mentioned that the males have that large comb-like antenna, and I do remember seeing pictures of those with the really large combs. So it almost looks like this one could have a comb, but it's kind of like the shorter ones. So is that that could be a like the difference is like this the um, like the the size of the combs, kind of like the size of the combs and moths. That's how I imagine it. Because these, uh, it almost looks like if you lengthened those, it would look like the comb. Then you don't, they don't look like cool eyebrows. <laughs> okay, fine. I hadn't finished yet, and you're right. They need to look like cool eyebrows. I hadn't even thought about that. So I'll go ahead and I'll put the antenna coming back right over on top of the eyeball. We're going to be going up through here. Alright, so the scape, the pedestal, it looks like the first two segments of the flagellum are a little bit longer. And then... Yeah, oh cool. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, there are nine segments in the flagellum. And I'm going to resketch these first two because after checking them out under the microscope, they're this really cool shape. I'm going to draw it really big here so that you can see. Um, so the pedestal is that really small triangular shape, so I'm just going to draw this little triangle here. But that first segment of the flagellum, where it almost looks like a large rectangle, it actually has kind of this spine coming up. And the next segment is the same way. It looks like a large box, but there is this spine that's coming up along the top. And then the rest of them all have spines like this, all going down. down a smidge. I can do that. Just playing with the light a little bit to make sure that we can still see all the body parts. There we go. Hopefully that's better. <clears throat> Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and give this as one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, and then club at the end. All right, you're totally right. Those look like awesome eyebrows.
So I just followed this same pattern where I was connecting to the very base, creating a triangle that comes out like this. And then coming back in and connecting them this way. So you have this flange here. And you can even um, you can even make the bases of these shorter. But I was just trying to show you an example. More like... Like this. Alrighty, so I'm gonna go ahead and erase some of that. We're gonna move. We're gonna move on. They look like shark teeth. That's fun. Yeah. So the uh, that last antennal segment is a very different sheep. Fair enough. All right. So that is the eye, the antenna, the mouth parts. Very good. Let's scooch. to be focused, I believe, because what we want to see is we want to see both the front of the thorax and kind of where that first leg is connected, so we can talk about that. Um, I am actually pretty happy with the location that the head is connected to the thorax and the size of it, so we're going to um, just darken this arch here really quick. Um, I am going to go just a little bit over where I thought, because you can see there's... Um, where the pronota meet the elytra, they meet in like a shallow dip. So I'm just going to go this way. All right. So we've got the front of the pronotum, and then we're going to follow this along back. It's probably not as long as I had originally sketched, so I'm going to shorten this um, this angle up here. And then I'm going to, if you measure right about here at the bottom, kind of two-thirds of your eye, this is about where you want to stop your pronotum. So you can take your arch down but once you get to about that point, you want to stop because that is about where the uh, the coxa or the hip bone is going to start for our beetle. So you can kind of create this shape here. And um, from here on, this is actually going to be a part of the leg. So I can point this out here, right there. And I went ahead and I checked the microscope just, just to be sure. But yes, this dark segment right here, that is the coxa, uh, kind of like the hip bone of a leg. We spell it like this. Um, and then plural, they're coxy with an E. Uh, and that's the hip bone of the insect. I'm just going to go ahead and give us the rest of our leg parts here so that um, as we're talking about them down the leg, you can refer to them. Um, and I only have to type them once. So that is the coxy right here. And then as we're moving down, this is going to be the femur, the tibia, and then our tarsal segments are over here. Um, we're going to be changing up the focus so that we can see them all. But I just wanted to make sure that you could see how this coxa um, was connected. So if you start right about here, you can see I kind of, I ended it kind of bluntly. Um, we're going to take that, and that is where our, the hip bone gets connected. <clears throat> All right. Now, at this point, um, you can choose to move your feet, go femur forward or your femur backward. Although, a natural pose would be the beetle's femur going in the forward direction. 
actually, let's go ahead and finish the thorax and then we'll add the legs. So at least we know where the legs are going to be connected. And I changed the focus. There we go. Very good. So, um, coming up to here, this is where our elytra are connected. I just want to start the elytra. Obviously, we can't see the whole, whole the whole end, so I'm going to leave the end open just a little bit. But um, starting up here, I'm going to give us this kind of arching shape, but then they uh, kind of flip from going a convex arch to a concave arch. Um, so it comes out like this, but then once you get to that point, this is where that triangle shape starts. And I'm just going to go ahead and give ourselves a light line there. And um, when we finish the elytra, I'll be able to finish that shape. Um, and then from here up at the top, I'm just going to make it go straight um, until about where we stopped for here. So it's about even. Very good. Now, um, moving down from our elytra here... <clears throat> Instead of this line being straight like we had originally sketched it, I'm just going to make it into an arch that meets that center line. Like that. And something that I hadn't noticed from before was this medial suture, this line here. All right. And the thorax is what's connected to the thorax, not the coxy. The coxy are kind of in addition. That's kind of where the leg essentially starts. So um, don't connect the thorax to the bottom of your coxy. You want to connect it all the way up here to the, um, to the pronotum, to this first segment of the thorax. So you can come all the way up here. And then... something along those lines and this this bottom part right here now that you see that this section is flat that's actually going to be where the uh, the middle coxy is and it's gonna be kind of this triangular shape we can't see it because it's underneath the front leg right now um, so I'm giving you an approximate shape we might be able to turn the beetle over um, when we're doing legs to see to see if we can um, to see if there are any corrections to that shape that we need to make. All right, very good. All right, so something that we are noticing here, um, we have this triangle coming down, and that is a segment, but it, there is also a thoracic segment above this too because you can see that wide arch now that we are looking at the glare gotta figure out how to change your cursor too oh that's funny yeah I, uh, I love um, personalized cursors <laughs> yeah, technically the coxa is connected to the trochanter. The trochanter is connected to the femur. Um, we just didn't sketch the uh, the connection between between the coxae and the femur because the the trochanter is generally so small that we can't see it. Um, we are gonna look for it and see if we can find it though. It does exist on. I would say most insects. I probably can't guarantee you that every insect has a trochanter. <laughs> um, but can you can you ensure anyone of anything about insects? Don't they? I feel like every rule for insects is meant to be broken by an insect. They're so well adapted, and they have so many like um, they, their life histories are insane and so whenever you come up with a real rule for insects they just break them anyway
it's reminiscent of like you know all insects have six legs except best beetle grubs because they only have four <laughs> but they get six when they're adults all right so i wanted to show you this because it's something that we regularly see in beetles um and that is that the front leg and the middle leg they have coxae that are kind of separated away from the body whereas the hind coxae sometimes we even call it a coxal plate um because it um we call it a coxal plate spelled this way And it's this dark segment, and it's stripped right here. So if we were looking at this whole segment that we had sketched, um, it's not just going to go straight down. You're going to have this segment that curves in and then continues down. And this one right here, that's the dark one, that's the coxal plate. So the femur connects directly from that. And it almost just looks like another segment of the, um, of the thorax sometimes. Um, and sometimes that coxal plate kind of uh, protrudes over the first segment of the abdomen. So it almost looks like the abdomen gets, the first segment of the abdomen gets like divided in half. Here, I'll give you an example. Um, so, there are a beetles where their coxal plate goes kind of like this. It comes out, and then the legs are connected here. But then, the abdomen is actually going to start here. So it appears like the first segment of the abdomen is divided in half, whereas it really is just that this coxal plate is kind of expanding over the first segment of the abdomen. And so that's what this is. This is a coxal plate. And that's where the femur is going to connect directly to. You can kind of see that the femur would connect right about here. Doop, right there. So if we were going to add the uh, connection to the leg, it would likely be right around there. So we can't really see the second coxa, can we? Not really. Let's look on the other side, see if we can see it on the other side. Well, it's right here. <laughs> so it might be. laying a little bit closer to the body. More like this. And then the leg connects to the bottom of that. So the leg would be connecting right here. All right, so I'm happy with our shape so far um, that we have our head and our thorax taken care of. And, you know, the first half of our elytra, um, we will be coming back for the legs. But let's sketch our abdomen, and then we'll have um, the whole body taken care of. Underpants, that's really funny, Hashi. So I wish I knew more about, I wish I knew more about wedge-shaped beetles so that I could tell you more about like their life history, um, what they do. I know that they're one of those insects that have hypermetamorphosis. So um, simple metamorphosis would be three life stages, an egg, a nymph, and an adult. Um, that would be like a praying mantis or a grasshopper. Um, and then you have complete metamorphosis, where you've got egg, larvae, pupae, adult, and that would be more like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly or a grub turning into a beetle. 
Then you have these guys, where they don't have three life stages, they don't have four life stages. Hypermetamorphosis means that they have five life stages. Um, and they're, so they have two different body forms for their, um, their immature stage. We still call them larvae, um, but we have two different kind of larval shapes, larval types. The first one, when the egg hatches, they're called a triungulin larvae. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start sketching the abdomen while I talk. Um, you guys can see it's focused too, so hopefully you guys can follow along as I sketch. Um, so we have these triangulin larvae, and they are really they're really itty bitty tiny, and they are adapted. Their body shape is adapted specifically for like finding their host and holding on and following them to wherever they're going to be feeding. And I believe that wedge-shaped beetles feed on, like, roaches? I believe that they are parasitic of roaches. Oh, okay, and, of, uh, and on a variety of species of bees and wasps. So they will, um, they'll kind of hop a ride, and then they will feed... All right, so their triangular larvae are mobile. They look a little bit like this. They've got a head, and then they've got thorax, and then they're going to have this, like, long abdomen with two little tails, and they're super-duper cute, and they will hold on to their host, and they'll ride their host to wherever their food is. If it's the roaches, I believe that they feed on the uthikas, the egg cases. Um, if it's a bee or a wasp, I believe that they are taking a ride back to the, the nest so that they can feed on the grubs. Um, but then they turn into, instead of this very mobile, Mobile grub, they turn into like, uh, like a fat white grub. Um, and this white grub, he's got a mouth and he can feed and he can grow, but he can't really walk anywhere. He is no longer mobile. And that's why we call it hypermetamorphosis, is because they have two different immature stages. So they go egg, triangulin, this grub like guy, and then they still pupate and become an adult. So, five life stages, because they are fancy. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get this, um, the elytra pointed out. So cute. And then we can see that the, uh, the elytra has some pretty colorations. The, that dark spot stripe is down the center of each elytra, and then you have orange on either side. Um, we are going to be able to, uh, we are going to turn the specimen so that we look at it dorsally at least one more time so that you can see it, but I'm just going to drop a little bit of graphite on the center band of that elytra to give it that shading. Um, triangulin. I wrote it up here on the board. Is that the same? As, is that the same as planidium? I'm not sure what planidium is. All right, the first segment of the abdomen is pretty wide, and then the second segment is probably about half that. And the third segment is about the same as the second. And then that last one almost looks like it's ca caved in just a little bit. Oh, it's not even the last one. All right. So this next one almost looks like it's caved in a little bit, but it is the one that kind of starts the abdomen kind of getting shorter. And then there is one final little itty bitty segment here at the end. So it looks like we have one, two, three, four, five and abdominal segments. And I'm going to go ahead and clean up one or two of these connections. He 
He's so cute so far. I'm pretty proud of him. All right, let's go ahead and look at our legs. Triungulin redirects to planidium on Wikipedia. Yes. I had never heard the word, I had never heard that phrase, planidium. The first, la the first in cell larvae of a beetle is called triungulin. Oh. It's best to use the term planidium. Cool. I had always just known of it as a triangulin larvae, but you're, um, but, uh, I guess planidium is going to be the more umbrella term for that, for that sort of grub, and they use triangulin specifically for blister beetles. Learn something new every day. Or at least that's what Wikipedia says. We have a leg here, and planidia often refers to a wasp larvae. So then, if it's planidia for wasp larvae and mantispid larvae, and it is triangulin for blister beetles, then is it still triangulin for the wedge-shaped beetles, or do we have another name? I've always just heard of them as triangulin. Um, I hadn't heard of I hadn't heard of the term planidia before, so I mean that's kind of cool though. Oh right, triangulin for these ones and blister beetles. Good, thank you, Eric. Okay, so. Um, we are looking at, we are looking at and focused on this front leg, and I was able to manipulate the, sh manipulate the angle that we were looking at so that we could see the entire leg in one focus. Um, it is kind of pointing backwards, so I'm going to be sketching it, um, in another angle, I hope. Um, but this is what he looks like so far. Mantispids are mantis flies. Mantids are praying mantises. So mantispids, um, the, the baby mantispids feed on, I believe they feed on ter, um, spider egg sacs. Like they wait for a female to lay for a female spider to lay her eggs and to start spinning the sack and then they jump in there and they get spun in with the eggs and then they just live in there and they eat spider eggs. <laughs> All right. So my femur, I'm going to have it going up kind of towards the head and I'm going to try and get yeah, I'm going to try and get the tibia to start coming down before the mouth so that it doesn't interact with these things. So we're going to see how this works. I'm going to get my femur and actually put it up, up here on top of the coxy. So uh, let's see. It's going to connect down here. It has, it's going to be straight on the... inside and then curved on the outside. All 
All right, so we have the start of our front leg, the femur coming up in this direction. I guess I could give you, I'll just write wedge-shaped wedge beetle, beetle up here for everybody. So we've got this femur here. The tibia is actually pretty short. It's like half of the length of the femur. Um, let's see. The, it, the tibia is also very narrow at the base and then gets wider as it goes forward. So it looks like we're going to be going on top of some of these palps, but that's going to be, that's all right. So our tibia is going to be coming down in this direction, starting narrow and getting wider. You do have, I think it's two tibial spurs, but I would like to go and double check that. one so there is one tibial spine I did turn it sideways just to double check So down here, um, the tibial spine is going to be on the inside of the leg, so it's going to be on the back away from the head. So we've got one spine. And then we have some tarsal segments. And my leg is not long enough. Blah, 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 blah. I shrunk my leg. We've got the one tibial spine, and then we're going to have these tarsal segments. Now, to me, it looks like we have five tarsal segments. We have the first one that's kind of that long rectangle. We have three what I would call cup tarsal segments that they're rounded like this, and they kind of sit in one another. And then the last one is elongated with two claws at the end. And if we were to change the focus and super zoom, um, on the end of the tarsal claws, I believe that each one of the claws is split into two. Um, I was noticing that when I was moving it around and thought it was really cool. So I might be able to show you that. I'm definitely going to try. Yes. You'll be able to see it, I think. So because of the way that the glare is coming through the other side... This is one tarsal claw at the very, very end of its tarsal segment. And right... Here, you can see the split at the end because you can see the little bit of light coming through. So each one of those claws, if we were going to zoom in right here on the end of that claw, it looks... looks like that where it's split at the end. All right, middle leg. I believe the front, the middle leg is going to be very similar to the front leg. I'm going to switch over to the middle leg on the other side, see if it's a little behaving a little bit better. Yep, much better. 
Now see, these all look like they have two tibial spines. I'm gonna have to reassess, but here we go. Trying to get the focus on the right leg. Here we go. So from this point, we can see the femur, the tibia, and the start of the tarsal segments. But we can't see the very end of the tarsal segments until... See, it has a really long tarsal segments until right about here. Okay. All right. So... Um, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through this because it almost, um, the legs are kind of um, almost intermingled with one another. This right here is the femur of the middle leg. Then you have, this is your tibia. These little two guys here, those are your tibial spines. There are two on the middle leg and two on the hind leg. Um, we're going to have to relook at that front leg. It's possible that the spines are like almost mobile and they open and close. Um, so we'll see about that. And then you've got these tarsal segments. And it looks like one, two, three, four, five tarsal segments and the claw. It's just that these ones are significantly longer than the front legs, tarsal, tarsal segments. So for here, we're going to be adding our leg to the very end of this coxy, uh, to the end of this coxa. And um, it's going to be coming up towards our body and then back down and we'll have the tarsal segments coming out here like they're on, like they're walking on the ground. Um, if we imagine that femur, I'm gonna cheat. If we imagine this femur here, That is 0.51, it's about here. So it's going to be coming up to right around here. Um, our middle leg should come up right around here where this arch is. Um, that's gonna be the uh, that's going to be the correct ratio. We are a little bit zoomed in, so if you see that measurement there, the measurement is not correct. Um, but the ratio is, right? So right here to here is going to be our femur. The one side is nice and straight, but then the other side, this side here, is going to be kind of rounded out. And that goes over a lot of those lines in here. But we'll go ahead and erase it because that's fine. So that gives us our femur, and the tibia is going to be coming back down. It is a little bit shorter. I want it to be wider, I think. Yeah, I think that's a little bit better. And it almost makes me want it just a little bit shorter, even though we measured that. That feels better to me. All right, so we have a femur here, and then our tibia is going to be a little bit shorter than that, so you can kind of take that, move it down. Your tibia is going to be nice and narrow at the top, and then it's going to kind of flare out or get wider at the base. And then you get those two tars um, those two tibial spines. Admittedly, I do know that the, there's a difference between tibial spines and tibial spurs, and I think that one of them is mobile and the other one is kind of connected to the exoskeleton and can't move. Can't remember which one is which. Is it a spine or a spur? 
I feel like the spine doesn't move, but the spurs are kind of mobile. They're on joints. All right, the five tarsal segments that are nice and narrow. These are toe segments. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. The first one is the longest. One. Two. Three. Four. And then that last one is rounded at the end with the claws. All right, so that is going to be our middle leg, and our hind leg, remember, is connected right here to the back of that hip, to the back of that coxal plate on the thorax. And I think somebody may, said that it was kind of like, I don't know, I thought that was funny. All right, let's see hind leg. I think that we can see most of the hind leg from this side. Now, the femur kind of looks bulbous in both directions on the hind leg. Oh, no. Now, my question is, is that the natural end of the leg, or are there missing toe segments? Guys, I think that my, my beetle is missing toes. Sorry about that. It doesn't look like either side has a full set in the hind legs. So that's the far side. You can see that it has three tarsal segments, and the close side has two tarsal segments. And neither of them have tarsal claws, which means that we are not looking at the end of the legs. Should be four tarsal segments on the hind leg. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Interesting. So that's kind of cool that um, that wedge-shaped beetles have a five-five-four tarsal formula. So it's funny because we regularly see five-five-five or four-four-four. Generally, um, they're going to have similar um, tarsal seg numbers, front, middle, and hind. But when you see five-five-four tarsal formula, that means five tarsi on the front leg five tarsi on the middle leg, and only four tarsi on the hind leg. A spur is inserted into a socket and is movable while a spine lacks a socket and is fixed. Thank you, Hashi! Genus for this one is Macrosigon. Oh, cool! Thank you, Eric! You're identifying my beetles for me. I hadn't gotten to genus on this guy yet. Um, what is the, do you know what the distinguishing feature is for this genus? Macrosigon SP. And I guess I could tell you where it was collected. It was collected in Iowa. Bettendorf. Bettendorf, Iowa. That must have been a while ago. 2011. This is a 12-year-old specimen. Very cool. All right, thank you. So this femur right here is almost bulbous on that hind leg. Um, you can see that it kind of get, it gets a lot wider at the end. Um, and let's see, our femur, where it's going to start here, is probably going to protrude all the way to about middle of the abdomen, so probably around here. Let's see. I'm going to give myself a light outline to see if I can make the shape I like, because I do want to make sure that that, that, that um, expansion or that bulb on the hind leg is pretty obvious. But I don't want it to be... Maybe it should just be on the top. Yeah! Alright, so I'm going to be sketching my hind leg like this so that it gets nice and bulbous on the top but it stays kind of flatter on the bottom. 
So that's going to be the femur. And the tibia is nice and long, probably as long or longer than the femur. So it's going to be angled out more like this. It also is narrow at the top and gets wider at the base with two tarsal spurs. There we go. And then... And then we have four segments, although we can only see three. I think if we, we can refocus this so that you're looking at the hind leg because at least the other side, oh, I had moved it. Because at least this one, ooh, that one has three of its four tarsal segments. One, two, three. And I'm going to give the last tarsal segment, I'm going to make it rounded and put claws on the end of it. Um, oh, he's so cute. Interesting, the tarsal segments on the middle leg are so much longer and more slender than the other legs. That is interesting. I wonder if it has something to do with their balance because they're so tall. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and look at it from above because I think that we mostly just looked at it from above in the beginning. And I want to share with you how pretty the elytra are. So this is what the elytra look like from the top. They have that dark band all the way around the edges, but they're mostly gold in the center. And then when we scooch our specimen back just a little bit, we can see that you're not looking at the top of the abdomen, even from this point of view. You're actually looking at the wings, right? So... This is normally how I see them. The question that's floating around in my head right now is, hey, but beetles' wings normally fold under their elytra, right? But these elytra end so short that the wings actually continue out from underneath them. So maybe something that I do want to add to my sketch is not only these elytra, but maybe adding the wings just a little bit so that they continue kind of over and past the abdomen. shaped beetle. Um, thank you, Eric, for helping us identify it to genus, the genus Macrosigon species. Um, so I'll be, I'll be looking into the species of microsig Macrosigon to see if I can get it even further. That's going to be fun. Um, ooh. Siagon. AI. So this is um, this is our identification before keying it out. You know, I always there's a part of me that loves to try to identify things based on based on like body shape and color and characteristics and location. And there's another part of me that's like the very trained entomologist that says, you can't identify it to species without going through a key. Um, just because there are so many species that look so similar to one another. Um, but I would say Macrosigon say is, um, um, I would, uh, that's definitely going to be a place to look.
Highly variable in color. Oh, good! Yeah. So, like, that's the thing that repeats in my head over and over is, like, you can't identify things to color. You need to use keys. Um, but I love, I, like, I want to identify things by color and shape and things. And then you have programs like iNaturalist that do pretty good at identifying things um, based off of pictures. They're not 100% accurate, but they get you pretty far. So, alas, that's my little, uh, that's my little rant about bug ID. Um, let's see. I have some exciting things happening, but I'm going to wait to show you until another time. Um, I can go ahead. I know that a lot of you like to see my sketch in a bigger view. So this is what my wedge-shaped beetle looks like. I hope that you love yours too and that you got to spend your time, um, you know, listening to me babble about bugs because it's what I do and what I love. Um, only pretty good for the species and life stages it's trained on. I guess that's true too because, um, with, uh, it's probably pretty good with butterflies and moths, but may not be as accurate for caterpillars, for instance. So many noctuids are difficult to identify just based on their pictures. And then you have to really get down into, like, um, to hair graphs for caterpillars. And um, actually, that would be something that I would enjoy going through with you. Um, maybe one day we'll go through and we'll key out some caterpillars. Because I, I don't know if I've ever shown you these. Um, caterpillars, mm. caterpillars, when you're identifying them, you need to, there's a handful of characteristics you're looking at. You look at the, um, you look at the crochets, which are the little hooks on the bottom of their feet. You look at their, um, you look at their eye formations because caterpillars have unique, simple eye kind of eye formations. And then... You look at their hairs. So all caterpillars, um, every single hair on a caterpillar is named and numbered. And this is how you identify caterpillars um, to down to family and then likely down to species too. I've mostly just identified caterpillars to family. Um, but yeah, you're using these shields that are like um, sclerotized or hardened areas of their of their exoskeleton, and then you have dorsal, subdorsal, lateral, subventral, and ventral, and they kind of just divide it out and then number them. And uh, yeah, so that's a fun time, and maybe one day we'll go through. Oh, the book is green, so it's totally see through. Um, maybe one day we will go through and um, identify that. And the guy who wrote this book, Fred Stare, uh, we used to have lunch regularly together, so he signed both of these books for me. We used to work in the same museum. All right, so very, very good. I am so happy that we got to sketch this together. Um, we are not going to be live streaming... We are not going to be live streaming on Sunday. Yeah, there will be no live stream on Sunday because I'm located in Philadelphia and the Eagles are playing to see if they're going to make it to the Super Bowl and therefore I um, I need to be out there, you know, having fun with uh, my, uh, my fellow city people. So, uh, um, we won't be having a live stream this Sunday, so the next time you'll be able to see me is next Thursday on February 2nd. <laughs> Go Eagles! Um, so we'll, I'll see you next February 2nd. Um, feel free, if you had a great time sketching with me today, go ahead and make sure you tag me if you share your sketch on social media, Facebook or Instagram or wherever. Um, if you aren't going to share your sketch and you would still like for me to see it, because I absolutely love to see the art that's created during these live streams, um, you can go ahead and send me an email at trisha at theinsectopia.com. Um, I have, you know, a little running file of all of the sketches that you guys have made and I'm not sure 
what exactly I'm going to do with it, but I absolutely love looking through them. <laughs> so that is um, that is great. I super appreciate it. And um, up there, there's a little logo for Out School. It's where I teach for. It's where I teach students ages five to eight, nine to twelve. Um, we do junior bug club, weekly insect studies, and we talk all about different types of insects, those types of things. Um, I also do a little bit of illustration with the kiddos, too. Their classes are only about 45 minutes, whereas these live streams tend to go about an hour and a half. So there's a little bit of that time difference, but we still get some pretty decent sketches in with the kiddos. Now, um, this is just a reminder to make sure that you're subscribed to the to my YouTube channel so that you get notifications when I go live. Um, and 90% of the time, I mean to go live. I am sorry about that. Last week, somehow my um, my uh, streaming platform decided to go live without asking me. So, alas, it was the ghost in the basement. Um, and then down there is a little QR code that links directly to Insectopia's PayPal. Um, I have um, I've been using some of that money to on a on a um, new project that I'm excited about sharing with you guys. Um, shortly, once they're done, you'll be able to see them. Um, so that'll be pretty cool, and I really appreciate it. So if you um, if you uh, enjoyed hanging out with us today, you learned something, you're gonna walk away with a new appreciation for wedge shaped beetles, um, or you're gonna know what they are when you look at them outside when you find them, you know, rolling around in the grass. Um, you feel free to feel free to send me a couple of dollars there. Um, it means a lot. I appreciate it. Many of you already do, so I hate to ask every time, but, um, you know, this is what I do and what I love. So, very good. Let's see. I'm going to catch up on all our chats. I'm in Kansas City area, so go Chiefs, too. <laughs> yeah, that, too. Go, Eric. <laughs> Are you, am I going to bring my lucky insects? You know what? I would love to bring my camel crickets. They're the lucky insects that I was bringing um, during the when the Phillies were going to the World Series. Um, but the um, eagles seem to they don't seem to need my luck. They're on a roll. Um, also, my camel crickets are in the egg life stage, so I'm not sure if they're still lucky. I think the eggs have to hatch for them to like retrieve that. <laughs> I haven't sent you any yet because they're all unfinished. Oh, that's okay. I mean, mine are, um, mine are never colored either. Colored, the scientific illustrations don't need to be colored. And I have an entire aquatic insects book of sketches that are beautiful, that are super helpful for keying and identification that have no color. See? Oh, you can't see that. See? Whole bunches of them. So they can be complete in black and white if you'd like them to be. I could get sucked into this book, so we're not, that's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, that means that the parents passed away. That's true. So maybe they weren't so lucky. But also, the Phillies didn't win the World Series. So we tried really hard, and we brought as much luck as we could. But alas. So we're, um, we're sending better vibes to the Eagles. Now, um, I think that that is everything for today. Really, I have a, an adorable little dung beetle that I haven't pinned up yet, and I collected it last summer, and I've been dying to get it underneath the microscope to look at its little horns. And so I think within the next week, I'm going to try and schedule a pinning live stream so that I can get some more buggies on the board for us to see. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your week. I think that I think that we're all good. I believe that I answered all the questions. I want to thank Eric for helping identify the buggies and for keeping us all in line and for joining us. I really super duper appreciate it. And Susan for chatting and Hashi. And I think that was 
most of us, and Lorianne, you were here for a moment. I hope you are, you stuck around. Um, I always love seeing new new friends' names too. So um, I look forward to seeing everybody next Thursday. All right. I hope to see everybody next Thursday. And Hashi, yes, I can do that for you. I will send you a bio. I'll write that down right now so I don't forget. I think I, I think you asked once before and I forgot. Bio for Hashi. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your week, and I will see you next week. Stay buggy.